Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. Cabinets HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Justine Reichman. Justine, are you ready to be great today? I am. Thanks for having me. Progressive thinker Justine Reichman is a founder of Next Gen Chef, and she considers eating, a, eating healthy a basic human right. We are empowering the next generation of culinary innovators dedicated to regenerative, generative practices and making nutritious foods more affordable, says Justine, whose San Francisco-based platform supports socially-minded entrepreneurs with the resources they need to launch their businesses and begin creating greater access to quality food products. The expansive network offers real tools, including a director of more than 1,500 culinary mentors, helping research and development and dynamic community events. Justine adds, we want to change the conversation so that people everywhere demand a better food system. Justine, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to having this conversation and telling you a little bit more about Next Gen Chef. So Justine, why do you consider eating healthy a basic human right? Because I mean, I think most people don't consider that a human right, but you do. Why is that? I do. I do. Because I think if we go back to the simple foods that people ate forever, whether it was vegetables that they grew as a farmer, etc. Um, I think that we should all have access to that. It, they should not be putting, it should not be as expensive and inaccessible as it is today to get. Uh, so often we see people going to the stores to buy um, canned things and processed things because it's cheaper. Um, and now in this day and age, I think we're actually, there's going to be a change in the way things are being done because we do have to have more products in our house that are shelf stable. Oh gosh, sorry, one second, sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so I do, I think that people need to be able to have access to this and it should, and we hope to give them access through education, through innovation, through collaboration, so that they can understand what is available to them and why they should make those choices. A lot of times people take what they can get because they don't know any better because they don't have access to the information and they can't make an informed choice. Everyone deserves to have that information so that they can make the choice that's healthiest and best for them. So Justine, how did you come around to believing this was a basic human right? Did it just one day pop in your mind? Like, do you want to take this on as a life mission or is this like gradually building up or has this been um, your life's work? Well, when I was, we were living in Mexico city a couple of years ago, and I randomly met somebody that ran um, Fundacion CMR or worked for Fundacion CMR, uh, which was part of the CMR group. And he suggested when he asked me, he's like, so what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here with my partner and I'm trying to get a bit more involved in the community. But as I'm not Mexican, I can't work really here with a visa. So long story short, he invited me to meet with some of the folks at Fundacion CMR, and they told me a little bit about what they were doing. And I had told them uh, through conversation that I do photography and that I um, wanted to get involved. And so they invited me to go to um, a lower income part of Mexico where they provide education and innovation with this NGO. And so we went literally like that week, we met, we had lunch, and then we went there. Um, and when we got there, we were taken, it took us two or three cars. We had to switch from a regular car to a truck that had better uh, tires and could make it up the hill. Um, and we get up there and um, there's people with donkeys and there's people with their homes and they invite me in to share with me what this foundation has done for them. And they showed me all the, the produce that they were growing in their gardens and the way that they were able to build their homes and maintain them. And they actually made us food from what they grew. And the idea behind this foundation is that they provide the education so that the, and the organic seeds so that these people can grow healthy organic food, have enough for themselves and then have some left over. So I was really inspired by that. And when I came back to uh, Marin, I wanted to do something and I couldn't figure out exactly how this was going to transpire. So I had a cooking contest because at the end, um, at the end of the, sorry, we just got somebody in here. <clears throat> at the end of our stay there, 
What I had done was I had come up with an idea so that they could have additional revenue. This additional revenue was going to be derived from this contest that I created for the community there. The community did a recipe contest and we pulled in a, a top chef who helped build out a lot of the John George restaurants in New York, who then had a restaurant in Mexico, and he did this recipe contest. And so one of the people in this town submitted hers, won, and then the, it was put on the menu and then a portion of proceeds came back. Anyway, I didn't mean to give you such a long story there. No, that's, but that's the fine. idea was that when I moved back to, to California, I then decided how could I have an impact here? What would be impactful here? It's a different place, a different culture, different needs, right? So I decided to have these cooking contests and what I got was a lot of hobbyists. And I wasn't really into hobbyists uh, because I really wanted to have a larger impact and change the conversation, not just here in Marin, but around the world so that people would start through education, learn uh, to make healthier food choices, support those food businesses to make better for you food products, um, and then create a greater demand for them, diminishing the, the demand for just cheap, inexpensive products to fill our bellies that are not, necess not necessarily nutritious. So making these more accessible through education as well as um, through price point is the goal um, so that around the world, people will start demanding this and it will create a greater demand and then hopefully drive prices down because there will be more activity doing it uh, from farmer to shelf. So Justine, can you talk about how your, your Next Gen Chef platform is helping you, helping you do this? Yeah, sure. So next, the Next Gen Chef platform is a community that we built for food entrepreneurs that are looking to build better for you businesses. We connect these food entrepreneurs with mentors and resources and industry experts so that they can get where they wanna go a little bit faster. Many times people building their businesses don't necessarily have the expertise, all the different layers, all the different expertise that you need to build a business. Um, if you're a chef, maybe you are an amazing chef and you created your amazing product, but you, know, you don't understand how to market it or you don't understand how to build the finances around it. So we fill in the gaps there with giving our food entrepreneurs access to those resources that they need as they're building those businesses. Yeah, I mean. Um, part and parcel with that, sorry, um, is that, you know, in addition to that, we do these, we have programming. And since COVID-19, we've switched our programming a little bit so that we have programming Monday through Friday. Um, these programs we've now made accessible and open to everyone because the more we can build the community, the, the better the community will be for everybody. Um, and these talks, bring in experts and sandbox ideas with the, with the members and the, men, and the entrepreneurs so that they can continue to network, collaborate and innovate, even from the comfort of their home while they're trying to work remotely in these uncertain times. So on a little bit about our programming, it looks a little like this. On Tuesdays, we have Lunch and Learns. They are at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're there for about an hour and we do them on Zoom at the moment. And these lunch and learns are really an opportunity for us to bring in an expert to talk about something that is topical at this time. So maybe it's food safety and how it, you know, and things that you need to consider and maybe change or understand as it relates to COVID-19, both as a food business and well as an end consumer. Because there's so many questions. I mean, you go to the store, right? <laughs> and you want to know where everything is coming from. We all do. So that's something that's very topical and people, whether they're building a business or whether they're buying product, want to understand a little bit more about food security, food safety. So that's just one example. On um, next Wednesday, we're going to have a Next Gen Chef talk that we're partnering with SF Design Week on, where we have Clement, who is one of the owners of Sugarfish, a restaurant that's in Los Angeles and New York, um, as well as Chloe Sorvino, who is one of the editors for Forbes who covers food. Um, and I'm not sure at the top of my head who the other person is that we have, I apologize. But the idea is to talk about the impact of design for these restaurants in this changing time. So what did it look like four weeks beforehand, before COVID-19? What does it look like now? And how do people design their future given the new set of circumstances we have? So that's just what our Next Gen Chef Talks are about. They're a little bit longer in format, 
there are some uh, additional breakout sessions. So we try to keep it intimate so that people can raise their own concerns. And it's not just a one-way conversation. It's not just the speakers speaking at the audience, but rather an opportunity for a group of people to be led in a conversation and inspired by some of these thoughts and ideas and bringing into experts to share their point of view. Um, on Thursdays, we do office hours where we rotate in mentors to offer uh, mentor office hours to our members. And then on Fridays, we have Nibbles, Networking, and Negronis, um, which is an opportunity for us to invite influencers and members and mentors and um, people of the industry to come and chat and hear what's new and what's going on. And, and uh, we bring in different sponsors to do different activities to make it experiential and to uh, give people an opportunity to check out new products. Justine, for your platform, does someone have to have a certain size restaurant or anything like that? Or what's the, what's the demographic going after? Well, you know, we go after people that, the people that have come to us so far are some people that have just an idea and they're trying to figure it out. They still have their full-time job. And then there's other people that are in stores um, in a variety of places and want to expand. They want to, maybe they're in Sonoma and they want to expand to, um, the Bay Area more towards San Francisco and uh, the East Bay. We have people that are global. We have people that are in Europe. Um, and the idea is that we want to build a community that's the pinnacle resource for everyone in food that wants to build better for you food businesses. Even if they're not there today, that it's on their radar, that they want to become a regenerative business and that they're working towards uh, creating greater access for healthy food. The best version of it. It doesn't mean salad. It just means the best version of the product that anyone is creating. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you're right. Most a lot of people think healthy food. They automatically think salad, right? <laughs> so, uh, Justine, you talked about a little about your lunch and learn. How long have you been doing those? And and of course, I'm sure they're over Zoom now. But where did they take place at before? So the the next gen chef talks. Not that you asked me about that. You did. They've been going on for I would say since uh, over a year now. Uh, the Lunch and Learns are just something we started with, and it was originally supposed to be a whole day activity called Next Gen Chef Activate. And we had partnered with um, TechSpace, which is a co-working space in San Francisco, and they were going to host us for the day, give us uh, desks for our members. Uh, we were going to have office hours. We were going to have a Lunch and Learn there that they were sponsoring. This happened right as COVID-19 came into play. So about a week before we canceled it and moved our, it to our lunch and learn and equally then moved our office hours, which we've done both virtual and in person, made them all online and weekly. So the, the format will be kind of as I explained at a co-working space. It's meant to be a place where people can convene, come together, get to know each other, both informally as well as um, connecting and collaborating uh, through a a um, shared mission. Yes, and, and uh, like I'm pretty sure no one opens a restaurant and says, you know, I'm a great, you know, Italian chef, a great whatever chef, and I'm really looking forward to doing marketing. I'm really looking forward to doing my bookkeeping, right? Right. It's true. People do, and sometimes they don't have the access. Many people that are chefs, maybe they know many, many other chefs, or people in marketing may know other people in marketing. So for us, it allows us to tap into all the different markets and really find the best talent and the best resources for them to pull together to create that interim team. They're kind of like working mentors, if you will. Um, but after a certain point, you know, they're no longer mentors and there's an opportunity if they do want to hire them or bring them on for a revenue share. We do a revenue share model uh, where we have an agreement that they can, if it's a good fit, uh, do with the member and the mentor. So that if they're both investing their time and they're both investing uh, in, in this business, that it would be a win for both of them. Justine, so you're already doing a lot giving back to your community, but something else you're doing now is you have a GoFundMe account to help restaurants out in, in the current time. Can you talk about that some? So yeah, I just launched it. I haven't, to be honest, done at all anything with it very much. I really, I posted it once on LinkedIn. Um, and what we were trying to do was in order to do all these talks and everything, we really wanted to make them free to everybody. And what we're doing right now is we're giving away a couple free months membership with the GoFundMe account. We want to open it up to everyone in restaurants and food so that they can pivot and they can 
change according to the times and have access to it. So in general, you know, it costs us maybe, you know, 50 bucks a month to run something per person. What we want to do is, you know, we're, we're right now, we're inviting everyone to join for free. We'd like to at least be able to, you know, offer this to another 500 people. And in order to do that, we're trying to raise some money to do that with a GoFundMe account so that they can have the access. Um, we're seeing a lot of people right now uh, pivoting from their restaurants to even selling their food as groceries to doing takeaway. And that's going to, that's going to change. Um, and it's going to, some businesses are going to close and we're going to see a lot of these businesses having to reevaluate where they are. Um, maybe they're going to make it, but maybe they have to redesign what it's going to look like because people don't want to sit on top of each other anymore. And then that's going to affect their cash flow and what they bring in. So I really want to support them so that they can make it through this time to continue. And at the end of it, we still, they still have their businesses and the community and have the access to the resources and mentors that they needed to be able to maintain. I'm the type of person I always try to get something positive out of everything and thinking positive. And one thing like who, who would have thought that, you know, the restaurant industry would, would cause the economy like, you know, go down like it is. Right. I mean, who would ever thought that, right? Like, Oh, restaurants are closed down. They're not really a main cog economy. That's, that's no big deal. Right. But it's a very big deal. Right. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, but a lot of industries are going to change. I was having a, a conversation with a friend of mine the other day who works in beauty and um, they do a lot of uh, stuff for the face dermatological and even just thinking about the samples, whether it's food or beauty, right? Who's going to do samples anymore? How are people now going to sample, you know, and having to make more individualized and wrapped things is going to increase the cost. So how will that increase the, the overall business for those companies and getting the word out there and getting people to taste it. So we're trying to address that by offering opportunities for sampling uh, through our platform, through our events to give people access to make it more experiential and to give these brands a platform to share their product and a little insight on it. So Justine, you're already doing a lot. You're an entrepreneur, you have your own business, you're doing a lot of great things community, but you're also very involved in the San Francisco entrepreneurial community through Founders Institute. First of all, I have no idea how you're even the time to do something that besides your business, you know. <laughs> so can you talk about your role in Founders Institute and all the great things they're doing for startups across the world? Sure. Founders Institute is a great resource for startups. And not it was um, it was in the fall of 2018. Um, I, you know, I was a co-director of the East Bay um, uh, initiative over there, and they focused on uh, socially minded startups. So I loved it and I still am a mentor there. And we did not continue to do the Founder Institute um, East Bay just because it was not the right place for it, but I, or at this time, um, but hoping that we will then start up another one. I've been in touch with the other co-directors there and we're just trying to find the right time and place um, and the right audience because we don't want to step on the toes of San Francisco and the South Bay and the peninsula and all the other places around here. Um, but to tell you a little bit about the Founder Institute, it's an accelerator program for people that wanted our startups. And it really gives them the, the, it gives them the roadmap to be able to, ever, to start their business from incorporating to creating an MVP. It gives them access to um, a variety of resources that help them in every aspect. They're walked through it basically on a week to week basis. Many of these people, some of these people, I should say, don't even have an idea. So they're just entrepreneurs. So it's not specifically about one industry or another. It's that it's tech enabled. Um, and for the East Bay, it was socially minded. But it's really to support entrepreneurs. They have a special DNA test that they give everyone, whether you're a mentor, director, or entrepreneur going through the program that you have to take. Um, and this sort of tells you whether or not you have the DNA to be an entrepreneur from their standpoint. This is how they make part of their evaluation. And the program in itself is really robust. It's um, got a lot of great resources to it. And it continues even after you go through it. They have another program called The Lab that helps with funding. And they have a very large pool of former graduates as well as other directors that are there to help you as you're building out your business. So Justine, like San Francisco, just Silicon Valley, the whole Bay Area, you know, like entrepreneurship, innovative, you know, all these great companies are built there, you know, great VCs. Other cities have tried to copy that, right? 
how come no other place can copy San Francisco? What is it about the Silicon Valley that's just so great that, you know, stuff just happens there, you know? Well, you know, it's interesting because I come from New York and I had a startup in New York as well. And um, I would say I'm a little bit newer to the Silicon Valley startup environment. And I've been in it about a year and a half now ish. And um, it really, it has that same energy and vibe as I found in New York, which I thought I'd never find again. <laughs> Even though I hear about it all the time, Silicon Valley, you know, it is different. And I think that the people here are a little bit different than they are in New York um, culturally as well. And I think that it be has become the melting pot for all of these places. They've come out of here, they're here, they know each other, they are great resources for each other. They're within arm's reach of each other. And there's a whole system built in to support them. I don't know that every other city has that. I think they might just be a little bit behind, but I do think that cities are starting to build their own Silicon Valleys, if you will, especially with the cost of rent and living in the Bay Area. We're seeing a lot of people move elsewhere um, and a lot of the companies are asking them to move uh, because the salaries can be a little bit less or people are just deciding to move because they can, they can have a better lifestyle but equally still be part of Silicon Valley especially yes. now working remotely. Yes. So Justine, you talk about this a little bit. Can you expand on your own entrepreneurial journey? Like why be an entrepreneur versus making hundreds of thousands of dollars doing something else? Why be an entrepreneur? Um, well, I think, you know, I, I really believe that we're shaped like from the time we can walk and talk and from the time we come out of our mother's belly, right? And so from the minute I could understand what was going on in my life. My mother was sitting at her at the dining room table with her own business. My grandfather had his own business. My father did, you know, his own business. I think that that's all I ever knew. Not that, of course, you could be an attorney, you could be a doctor, but I was inspired by it because really they, they made their own path. They could dictate the impact they wanted to have. And that was aspirational and inspirational for me. Yeah, I, I might be making this up, but I'm pretty sure I read a stat somewhere that says like 80% of entrepreneurs, like it, when they're a kid, they either sold a newspaper or had a lemonade stand or like you just don't wake up one day being an entrepreneur. Like you, it's been in your blood since you were a little kid, right? I think, yes, I think so. Yeah, I used to, I had a lemonade stand. I think my mother told me it cost her more than I actually made. <laughs> yes. need to have to stand. Yes. So what, what's your goal for Next Gen Chef? My goal for Next vision? Gen Chef is to you know, now that we are moving so much online, is to get this situated in the short term to then scale it and be able to replicate it in different cities and countries around the world, because a lot of the talks that we're having are relevant in different cities. Um, and the conversations uh, are inspirational as well as really informative for a lot of our members. And <clears throat> I think that by um, expanding to different cities, we bring in other experiences and can maybe grow together and share some of the insights we have on a global level to make better for you food. So I'd like to see us having lunch and learns in three different or four different times, three different time zones, maybe four different cities. Um, and I'd like us to have uh, the network next gen chefs in three different uh, time zones as well. And one thing we didn't talk about and that we haven't done at this moment, <clears throat> excuse me, are our feasts, which are regenerative and local, rege uh, regenerative and local, regenerative and plant-based and regenerative and infused. And it's a series of dinners that we do hope um, that we're going to be able to relaunch again in June and then have those, have that series in three different cities each year um, within the U.S. and then in the next few years expand globally to have them. Last year we had one, we had a Michelin starred chef who made the food, uh, Jeremy Nelson, who came out of Lazy Bear. And it was all about connecting our food entrepreneurs uh, with the farmers and the products that they're creating and that are local to show how we source our meals and create a really fabulous, local, healthy, regenerative meal. So Justine, so, uh, for the people in your platform, uh, are they having the same challenges or any specific challenges that everyone's having that you help them out with? Um, I think that we're having, you know, people, the challenges have changed to some extent right now, um, because as you can imagine, sourcing and all those things, you know, is changed right now. Things coming from other countries, how they're going to deal with that, even uh, regulation. So we're trying to build out some of our next gen chef talks and we've added 
in uh, another series to talk about how to address some of these issues in this changing uncertain times, whether it's around sourcing, whether it's around marketing, whether it's around uh, financials, so that these in, so that these entrepreneurs can get the advice and the uh, access that they need to be able to pivot or make any new decisions um, in light of what's going on. Justine, based on everything going on right now, what do you see the restaurant industry being in five years? Like, what do you see changing? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I don't know how I see the, the restaurant. It's, it's so hard for me to say because I think about uh, Asia and you know, where or China, where they've had uh, pandemics like this before, right? SARS and bird flu and, and all these different things. And what happens is they, I guess, quarantine them for a little while um, and then people go back to normal, whatever their normal is. I've seen many times people wearing masks. Um, but, you know, we haven't really had this experience before. So I think this is a new, this is a new set of circumstances, which is going to change how people think and what they do. And I don't know how long it's going to go on. So I don't know, I can't predict how people are going to move forward after this. Are they going to go back to normal? Like, you know, in much of Asia that they do, um, their new normal or, is it going to completely change how we do things? Are people not going to want to go sit next to each other? Or are people just so excited about it? I don't really know. So in the next five years, um, gosh, I wish I had a better answer for you. I just feel like I don't have enough information. And this is the first pandemic I've experienced. And there's so many uncertainties. Um, I hope to see that restaurants are opening, that they are booming, that people are comfortable and sitting in them and enjoying the food, the experience and their family and friends safely and healthily and hoping that maybe there's just some new guidelines that are put in place to make sure that the food and the staff and the people are safe. Uh, I mean, this is me. I think there's someone out there who's going to, who's going to innovate and figure out a way to do both. Like how do the social interactions that we all want to experience and also do safety. I think someone's out there that we don't know about is going to figure it out. Right. Cause what, I mean, I saw the slide, I think on LinkedIn, like all the great companies are, are uh, started in the last recession, right? Uber, Instagram, you know, so I think someone's going to do that. Yeah, I think, I think that there's going to be some new innovations around it. Um, I wonder what technology robotics will play in it. I didn't think about that. That's a great idea. That's a great point. Robotics. I think that that's uh, more and more that's being, that's participating in many things that are going on for the future. So I could see that being a potentially new uh, integration for restaurants and serving food. But I'm eager to see how this all plays out. And I hope that we come out of it a little bit more empathetic, a little bit more aware, um, taking into account some of the new lifestyle changes that we've made to maintain these healthy lives that we're, we have a privilege of having. And that's the th thing I think too, and I gotta make sure I word this right. Like being an entrepreneur is not easy. It's, 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 you know, it's difficult. But I think recently a lot of people just like, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start a restaurant, right? And a lot of people probably shouldn't be. They're probably great chefs, but probably not you know, great entrepreneurs. I think this is going to knock all those people out of their right. And then the ones who are actually are good entrepreneurs are gonna going to excel. This is my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, well, I also, you know, that we've got a pretty high um, unemployment rate right now, right? I think it's pretty high, uh, higher than it's been in a while. So. I don't know how people get pretty innovative and creative in times of, you know, in, in crisis. So I don't know what, how it's going to drive people and what they're going to do, but I do know that people are resilient. I, you know, being from New York, I was there during 9-11. I was there during Hurricane Sandy or I forget the other one. And people come together, they support each other, they're innovative and they want to make the best out of it. So be the glass half full person that I am. I'm hoping that this will ring true here. I think we're already seeing the amazing generosity of our, of our friends and family around the world and how they've come together to support each other, the, the first responders, their community, uh, etc. I mean, it, there's a whole other question about these small businesses and these small restaurants and are we doing them a, a service by ordering from them because they're a small business and we want to keep them alive or are we indulging them and they're staying in the front lines and making them sick but equally i don't know that they have a choice that's a that's a very good point i didn't think about that that's a very good point exactly justine so which aspect of hr is going to be taking up the most of your time for your business 
Um, so the greatest challenge with HR for us is just, um, is literally all the paperwork and the onboarding um, and making sure that everyone has consistent messaging and that they understand all the tools that we have. The structure that we set up as a startup can be scrappy. Um, and I think one of our challenges is just making sure that we have everything set in place from, you know, making sure that our 1099s go out to, you know, getting all that paperwork, all the stuff you don't like to do. Yes, I mean. <laughs> that would be, that is my biggest shortcoming. It is not my superpower. <laughs> Although I am really trying to integrate it and make sure that I do it from the beginning because it's really hard to um, to go backwards and then do it. Exactly. Justine, I understand you have something for our listeners today. I do. We are offering everyone that has been, that is interested in creating healthier food systems, learning more about them, building a business, or just an end consumer and wants to know why they should make the healthier food choice uh, to join next gen chef. We're offering a three months free trial. You can email me directly at justine at nextgenchef.com. That's J U S T I N E at nextgenchef.com. Um, you can also always uh, email our team team at nextgenchef.com with any questions. We will be launching a new app in the next month. So if you can join now, you'll have free access to that too. It will give you access to events, office hours, um, next gen chef talks, you'll be able to email, text and call people directly from the app. So join now, you will have free access to that as well. And we are excited to grow our community and learn from your listeners, from the new food entrepreneurs out there, what kind of issues they're facing so that we can make sure to build as robust a resource for them as possible. Justine, can you share your social media, social media links for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure. Uh, our Instagram is at nextgenchef.com. Our Facebook is at, and then nextgenchef is actually separated into three words. For some reason, they're not letting us put it all together. Our Instagram is underscore nextgenchef. And my email, uh, I'm sorry, my Instagram and Facebook is uh, Justine. Reichman, J-U-S-T-I-N-E, Reichman, R-E-I-C-H-M-A-N. On Instagram, there's an underscore between the first and the last name. I hope you guys will all reach out to me. Uh, email me your questions, text me your thoughts. Let me know the challenges you're facing. Uh, and if you're a resource and you want to support these individuals, I hope you'll reach out, reach out to me as well. And so listen, we have the link to her gift and her social media links on our, on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetstateshowblog.com. And be sure to share this, this episode with your friends. Thank you yes. for having me. Yes. Justine, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us, our listeners, any advice on any subject you want to talk about? Any advice on any subject I want to talk about? Um, so I think as entrepreneurs, as people in this world, and going through these uncertain times, I think it's really important to take a few minutes and create some normalcy for yourself and give yourself a little bit of time to relax. There's so, for me, I find I can constantly go through the days and the weekend working with, uh, there's no defined time. Everything seems to lead together. So what I'm trying to do, what I encourage everyone else to do is maybe at five o'clock, try stop working. On the weekends, try to actually take Saturday and Sunday, whether it's that you're gonna go walk your dog, watch some movies, cook, but I feel, for me, it's really made a huge impact, allowed me to be more efficient, effective, and hardworking during the weekdays and during the time of day when I want to be working, um, and allowed me to join, actually enjoy my free time, even though I'm in the house and we are self-quarantined. Uh, it's, um, I found to be really beneficial. So I hope that you'll try that and let me know how it goes for you. And if you find it troublesome, are you or it's easy to do, I'd love to hear from you. The other thing I'd like to recommend is um, I actually now get a mindful text um, from Mindful Text. And if I find that that's really thought provoking and it gives me a few minutes just to be quiet with my thoughts and, um, and, and think a little bit about you know, what I wanna do and quiet my mind. Uh, so if that's interesting to you, also send me a note and I can share that link with you. We have a partnership with them and you can get a, a daily text from Mindful Text, which I think is really inspirational. Justine, thanks for that. Justine, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you having me. Thanks for the invitation. And I hope you're staying happy, healthy, and safe. Yes. 
And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.